everyone, I am Athena and I'm here with Lisa and we are interviewing Craig Piggott. He is the CEO and founder of Halter and we're going to be talking about how artificial intelligence is evolving the farming industry. And then after that, we're going to have your questions and comments from you, the community of tomorrow. So stay tuned. Tomorrow's Science Discovery 1.09 begins right now. I'm super excited for this interview today because we have this CEO of Halter, Craig Piggott. Uh, he started the company back in 2016 and actually won last year. The company won the New Zealand Innovation Awards. And Craig is a finalist this year for the New Zealand High Tech Young Achiever Awards. So Craig, thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday, early morning Sunday in New Zealand uh, to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Not a problem at all. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, so the first question I actually wanted to ask you today is uh, what brought you to actually starting uh, this business and starting Halter? Yeah, so, um, well, I guess firstly, the important thing to note is uh, I grew up on a farm. So uh, everything I did when I was younger, um, when I was going to school, that kind of stuff was was evolved around, uh, around farming. And it's everything my family had done, my parents had done. So um, that's probably the, the important part. And then um, I went off and studied mechanical engineering um, here in New Zealand up at Auckland University. Uh, and because of that, actually, I found myself working at a, a local company here, well, actually headquartered over, over in the US, but uh, called Rocket Lab. And as a mechanical engineer, this was like my, my dream job, working for a, for a rocket company. Um, but pretty quickly it became clear that uh, Peter Beck, who, who started Rocket Lab, was sitting there in, uh, in New Zealand creating this entire new industry. Like the space industry in New Zealand just didn't exist. And uh, Pete's here just, just creating it. And the industry we're most known for, the, the dairy industry, just has so many fundamental problems. And really, I was sitting there being like, hey, I, well, I understand this industry. I grew up in it. Um, I feel like there's a huge opportunity here. So ultimately, that was, that was really the founding moment. Um, I'd seen you know, a high performing team operate at Rocket Lab and they go through uh, equity raises and see that whole, I guess, journey. So um, kind of thought, why, why couldn't we do the same thing with, with a different industry? And that's really um, the founding moments. What about the dairy industry? Um, where are there problems? So where are the problems that you were discussing earlier? Yeah, so the biggest fundamental problem at the moment in the dairy industry is revolt, like is based around labor. So um, just if you go talk to really any farmer, uh, they're doing 80 to 100 hour weeks. They can't find good staff. No one really wants to enter that industry anymore. Um, the What used to drive a lot of young people to enter, say, as like a farm assistant or a herd manager or any kind of entry level job on the dairy industry was the pathway from that to owning a farm. Um, today's day and age, that pathway is just so, so uh, long and seemingly impossible that no one really comes in the bottom with the vision that they're going to own a farm. So uh, because of that, there's this massive shortage of labor and it results in things like sustainable, like sustainable, sustainable farming, for instance, and be able to fence waterways. Um, you just don't really have the time to, to be able to do that, that kind of stuff when you're literally struggling just to uh, just to run all the, your usual activities. Wow, and it, your, your device is gonna take away that need for labor and in, in moving cows to, to different places in paddocks. So we've actually got a really cool animation that helps um, to show what the cows are actually doing. Can we talk us through a little bit about the device or the halter device and how that, that moves cows around? Yeah, so um, the kind of the fundamental concept behind like everything we do is we build this device that gives feedback to a cow. So um, it's based on Pavlovian theory. So if you've ever heard of like Pavlov's dogs, where if you ring a bell and the dog drools, um, effectively those two things aren't associated at all. Like there's no reason that when you ring a bell, the dog should drool, but you condition the dog to, to respond to the bell. So uh, it's a very, very similar concept to that. Um, 
this, this device conditions the cow to respond to audio and vibrationary cues. Um, and then after that, we're able to literally move a cow left and right uh, and forward and back. So it's an unbelievably powerful uh, like reassociation. But if you want to think about it from a fundamental level, um, it's really no different to say a dog barking at a cow. Um, we're literally just training cows to take what, what is usually a visual cue, such as a fence or a gateway, uh, and associate that with an audible one. Um, and this whole process only takes about like some of the smarter cows that can be two to three hours and some of the other ones would, you know, might take as long as six hours, but fundamentally it's still very, very quick. Wow. So how is um, that actually giving you guys the data and the information for whether a cow is eaten enough or needs something? What are the follow-up procedures if, say, a cow didn't eat enough? Yeah, well, this is um, a really interesting thing, and it's something that we got, uh, I guess, more and more clarity on uh, the longer and the, the longer we've been in field, I guess. But um, you put in a sensor in a device, um, just take an IMU, for instance, uh, that can tell you things like whether a cow's laying on its side sick or how much, how long it's spent with its head on the ground eating pasture, um, or really any like kind of classic machine learning technique, um, is, is nothing like that new. People have been using sensors to detect like status and things like walking, running, like your phone does this with you and Apple's been doing this for ages. Now, the problem is that typically that hasn't provided enough value to a farmer that you could justify putting the device on a cow. So uh, where we found ourselves, though, was because we can physically shift a cow, that has enormous benefit. That removes almost like half the labor on a dairy farm, removes the need for every single fence, um, every single like dog and bike. And you, you literally free up so much of the farmer's time that he can spend doing uh, other things or at least not working 100 hours in a week. So um, you've got this massive benefit, which gets the device on a cow. And then once it's there, you can do some really cool things. So you touched on there, um, if a cow hasn't eaten enough, for instance. So um, how that can work is you've got 400 cows, say in a herd, they go into a paddock and all the aggressive and the bigger ones eat first. And once they've reached their limit, we actually pull them back off the fresh break. So um, off the best grass. And then we allow the kind of the weaker or the slower cows to still uh, be in there accessing the, the longer pasture. And if it takes them longer to eat, that doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, they all eat the same amount where at the moment, it's a little bit like a hierarchical race where uh, the stronger ones eat more and get stronger and the weaker ones just end up going hungry a lot of the time. Wow. Um, so you mentioned, you know, you're combining that data from from being able to move the cows, but also the sensors that are telling you, you know, is the cow's ha uh, head down near the ground? Um, so, how much testing have have you done on this halter technology? Like, what kind of stage of development is the device actually at? Yeah. So, uh, the short answer is we're going through production at the moment. So, um, we're literally just getting everything ready to uh, scale through mass production. So, we're working with contract manufacturers in China and just trying to make sure that we're ready to roll this out because um, the average size of the farm is around 400, 420 cows. So you can see reasonably quickly, we need to be able to produce you know, 50,000 of these a month because it doesn't take too many farms to, to really push that demand up. So that's been our biggest focus at the moment. We've been in field testing on our own development farm for just over two years now. Um, so we have, we're headquartered in Auckland, New Zealand, and then uh, literally a couple of hours away, we have a test farm or a development farm. And that is the, the biggest asset for us as a company. It means we can very, very quickly uh, take our technology, take the algorithms and uh, the devices onto farm and actually put them uh, through like real world testing with, um, you know, with farmers and with actual cow sheds and all the, all the gear that you want. And you can do as much like whiteboard theory uh, as you feel like, but it's not truly until you get in field and start to understand how uh, how a cow is going to respond to this, how you're going to build trust between the device and the cow, just like, I guess, a rider and a horse. Things like that are all um, very hard to do in theory. So the best practice is just to get in field and, and start trying to do it. Speaking of how this actually affects the cow, uh, we have a question here from Space Mike, and he actually asks, is this humane and do the cows experience pain from these signals? Yeah, so like first and foremost, uh, we love our cows and this is like half the team here is, is from a farm. And if you talk to most, well, really any farmer, 
uh, they're actually like super passionate about what they do in the land and the cows. So um, definitely doesn't hurt the cows. Uh, when you put a device on a cow, you all of a sudden have 24 seven monitoring of that cow. And right now, if you're a farmer and you have a thousand cows, it's really hard to keep track of what, it, what all of them are doing. So we know if a cow has a sore foot seven weeks before a human can tell by eye. So yeah. things like that is just like, absolutely game changing for the health of an animal. And this is because like cows are stoic, so they hide their injuries. So they will not limp until it is really, really bad to the point where they physically can't not limp. But um, something they'll do a lot earlier than that is they stop walking voluntarily. So you put a cow in a paddock and it will just stand there and sit down. You know, if you've got a thousand cows, you don't really know, but we know straight away. We're like, oh, this cow stopped eating. This cow stopped walking. Uh, she's actually showing small signs of a change in gait, um, which you can pick up on an IMU. And then you can feed that information through to a farmer. And what it means is realistically, when you like drink, if this was a glass of milk, it's water, but if you are to drink your glass of milk in the morning, you can be like assured that it's come from uh, a farming operation where all the cows are at a certain level of health and potentially happiness, um, but they're also not in sensitive environments, they're not in rivers, or you know walking through low-lying wetlands and things like that so ultimately this is like if you're a conscious consumer um this is a huge shift in the industry that needs to happen um around like animal welfare and trying to improve the standards of operation there so um to put it in short the cows that we've been working with are on farm so some of those original you know the first i think herd of 30 that we started working with they're the friendliest cows on the farm by a long way Wow. How many have you worked with? Just a question. <laughs> uh, so our development farm is just under 300 cows. That's so we're cool. Kind of, we're strategic about like what ages, breeds, um, dominance. We kind of cycle through every situation. This is where the AI machine learning aspect comes in because every animal is so different that you need to understand like how sensitive that cow is to say sound and how agile they are and if they're like slightly older and slower you have to be more patient and really the only way this wouldn't be possible without like some form of uh machine learning because you just you couldn't physically categorize and code every different cow and how they behave that leads um incredibly well into this next question that uh you've, you've kind of half answered it already but from the chat room honey's war work from twitch um asks does your device give us a profile of each cow can we know them on like a personality level um, to know if, if they're acting normally or if they're acting sick? A hundred percent. So we already have uh, kind of profiles for a cow because uh, at this stage we're like switching devices a lot and you know, we get a new version in from, in from China and it will have maybe like a bit of, uh, bit of battery life or what would be more durable. And we have to literally download say Cal 300's profile and put it into into the next collar and then go from there. So um, like fundamentally, you could you could get to know a cow personally if, if there was the system set up to go right the way through to um, the consumer. Um, but in terms of things like sickness and health, that is, yeah, it is very, very easy to monitor, um, to monitor when cows are acting uh, not normal as such. So um, they're reasonably predictable, predictable animals. Wow, uh, there's a really good question here from the chat from Dada. He asks, does the system still work with high ambient noise environments? Yeah, well, this is um, quite interesting because when, when we're doing this really early and uh, we knew the theory could work, we knew that you could train, well, we tested pretty early and we could train a cow to, to respond to, to noise. But the concern was if you've got 400 cows in a paddock and they've all got like, you know, beeps and tones and they're all spinning mm -hmm. in circles and stuff. It's just going to be chaos. Um, but what we actually found was because the collar sits uh, right behind the ears of the cow, like um, literally probably two to three inches from the ears and the cow's ears are massive that you actually can't even hear the sound. So um, they respond so well to the sound that before it gets to any volume that's audible for us. And we're t I'm talking like if you were standing right next to it, you could probably within a half a meter, you could hear it. But if you're anything more than, three to five meters from the animal, you just can't tell. So um, it's actually a very specific noise um, that the cows get very used to uh, hearing and respond really well. So it doesn't really matter if these, I don't know, music playing from a house or 
people talking next door. Um, it's re- it's quite a distinctive sound for for the animal. Awesome. Um, so you're based in New Zealand, and New Zealand is famous uh, for sheep. We actually have a we have a, a comment in the chat room from Nigel off YouTube who asks, why just cows? Why not sheep also? New Zealand is famous for sheep. Yeah, well, th- this is a, uh, a really good question because if you think about every animal and when you're trying to train any animal, what are the fundamental principles of, of training an animal effectively? And that's you have to be consistent, you have to be repeatable, uh, you have to be patient. Now, these are all things which software are really, really good at, right? Like that's exactly what software does and humans are really bad at so if you think about like when people try and train their dog to sit and it might sit and they'll they'll give it a tree and then it won't sit and you still give it a tree and say like ah whatever and you do that maybe like once a week and three months later you, you hope that it sits now fundamentally every single animal in the world like should have some kind of like training or help with the decision making from like some software application so no, I, I truly believe that um, even, say, your domestic dog could have uh, a system that helped train it uh, more so than just, just a human. So um, sheep, that's one that comes up a lot, especially here in New Zealand. Um, I'm not a sheep farmer. We haven't tested that, so I can't comment, but I, I believe so. Um, I guess, yeah, you can look th- really through any animal, um, especially any animal that's, that's held in uh, like a paddock or with a fence or anything like that. What are the environmental impacts that you foresee this type of technology making? Well, the most obvious one uh, in New Zealand here is we have currently uh, a big thing with waterways. So uh, having nitrogen leach into uh, a waterway is like very bad for water quality. And um, the worst thing is when, say, cows are actually in the water. So uh, there's this big push at the moment to fence every single waterway in New Zealand. Now, there's like a lot of of kilometers of fence to do that and it's off, often a cost that a farmer can't sustain uh, and it's also like a, a time uh like it takes a, a, a large amount of time to, to be able to do that so um the most obvious thing for us is one we always come back to is like hey we can keep uh every single cow that, that has a collar on uh out of a river or out of any waterway and that can be a seasonal waterway so in winter it could be uh wet and have uh like actual kind of surface water and a cow doesn't go near it. And in the summer, we could graze that because it's got grass in it. So um, this is kind of the concept we can do now. Um, the other things that get quite interesting is fr- just through the, the device, we can tell uh, when a cow is urinating. So um, that's just through the machine learning uh, model that uh, that measures kind of motion and patterns. And, and so we know wherever there's been nitrogen managed uh, or discharged into, into the soil. So... Uh, you can start to try and do some things. We we're kind of looking through this stuff at the moment, but try and like even out the spread of nitrogen. So there's no highly concentrated areas that leach into the water table. So um, that's, I guess, one really good example um, around the one of the downsides of running like a pasture-based dairy farm system is you have the, the nitrogen issue that um, we're trying to work on here. And I think if we can get that to... A really good spot that's going to be un- like unbelievably powerful and and a real big asset for the future of um of this like farming industry wow uh mm. i just love the whole thing about managing nitrogen too i didn't even think about that as an yeah. application but you could even like train the cows to like go and lay nitrogen on different like areas of a farm and like you could have the, like fertilization for free um from the cows like close that cycle that's so cool um but coming, coming back to the, uh, the device itself, we've got a couple questions in our chat room here um, that kind of talk about um, uh, the security of the, of the device. So the first question comes from To Wicked off the chat room who says, uh, what guarantees can farmers have that someone couldn't just hack their herd for personal amusement or uh, sabotage? And following on from that, Dark Naze also asks, um, does the system use encryption? Uh, yes. So... From the, from the start, we've been very, very aware of, of the, security, um, the security issue here. And I guess when you, like, there's 1.5 billion cows in the world. So there's actually more kg of cow in the world than there is people. Um, and it's been pretty obvious that uh, that is like a, a, down in the future, if you have kind of a large amount of cows, like under management, then you have a, a big security issue. And 
like that's been ingrained from like our investors, from our board, from uh, the team internally here. Uh, it's very, very like serious issue that it's kind of like if you design it in and if you're aware of it early, then uh, it's a lot easier than coming back in a year's time and being like, oh, we need to try and um, add, you know, encryption keys to, to the payloads or whatever that is. But um, from the start, it's been it's been on the front of our minds and um, I'm pretty confident that the team in here has a good understanding of, of how serious that is. Wow. Um, there's a, a, another question actually regarding to the farmers by uh, Hennies Vorwerp in, in the chat. And they ask, how much work is it for the farmer to actually train these cows? And is it easy enough um, to not act as a deterrent? Yeah. So the, the important thing to note is the device itself actually trains the animals. So um, mm. that is like we fr from the start, we knew that if it literally meant the farmer spent more time on a keyboard or on an app than he does in real life, then he's just going to walk outside and do exactly what he currently does. Mm, right. So um, that's been that's been like one of the important things from the start. And this is like this is pretty funny because as a, uh, a startup, you always run really lean, right? You always only hire like the critical people and you work on your biggest risks. Now for us, one of the biggest risks has been like the user experience. Like how do you uh, take a farmer who traditionally um, has a lot of tech that he doesn't really like, it's not that useful. Um, he's sick of having, or she's sick of having people turn up and say, you know, you have a 3% gain in X over three years, and but you've got to do like all these things. You've got to learn this new system, and it's just like too much, and I don't have time, right? I'm time poor. I don't want to learn a new system unless it's going to completely change um, what I do. So we've been working with farmers from like almost the very start. Like I, well, I guess I grew up on a farm. Um, it was really easy just to pop around and visit like you know, 10, 20 of the neighbors. Um, we hired for, specifically for a user experience um, from the start. And uh, we spend probably like more time talking to farmers than really anybody else out there. Um, it's either like head down in here, um, working away on, on different things, or you're sitting down having a coffee with a farmer talking to you know what if we did this um or yeah, have a play on like the app and give us some feedback it's really really interesting what you learn um they're actually amazingly smart people um it's just trying to get the time out of them to to actually like make a difference in something like this so how do you um you know take a farmer that that doesn't want to be overwhelmed by tech um how do you design that user interface? Is it as simple as, you know, like having an iPad and, and you see your farm and you just kind of draw boxes on where you want the cows to go and where you don't? Is it that simple? Well, this is, so the simplest way you could do this, right? And this is maybe a little bit idealistic, but you could put uh, devices on a cow and you could tell a farmer, all right, for the next week, just run your farm completely as you used to. So um, we sit here, and we can see what time he milks in the morning. So, oh, okay, it's 5 a.m. and the cows are at the shed. Cool. He milks at 5 a.m. Uh, you could do the same thing in the afternoon. Okay, cows are at the shed. He's milking at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, he gives his cows, you know, it's July. He's giving his cows uh, so many hectares or so many acres of pasture. And you can almost get to the point where after this calibration week, we just copy it and he doesn't even need an app. So he just wakes up at, at 5 o'clock and the cows are at the shed. And we do that because that's what he was doing. So that's like one extreme. Now that's, I guess, not practical because different things, you know, if it's raining and it's two o'clock in the morning, um, the idea is that a farmer doesn't have to now get out of bed and hop on his bike and go pull those cows off the grass and put them on a pad to protect uh, the paddock. He can now just roll over, pull out his phone and say like, pull the cows off. So um, you're trying to make the interface like very, very simple. So it is this balance between Almost, they don't have to do anything to, um, you know, they can have as much control really as they want, um, as long as it doesn't go against kind of the fundamental principles of, of what we believe in. So um, we've got a few like, I guess, underlying golden rules or guidelines, things like you can never walk a cow through a river. Even if a farmer wants to, we don't let you. So these, these is the split between that, but um, fundamentally it's, uh, it's a reasonably simple system to use. Yeah, it sounds very simple. So do you think this will ever become completely self-automated where there will not be a need for a farmer? Well, this is um, like we live in this world of, of data, right? So mm -hmm. uh, literally, I don't know what, I can't remember what the stats are, but I think it's like less than 1% of, of data is actually analyzed and used. And this is where we think we've got like a big advantage and that's with effectively the first 
actually like or actual actuation on a farm. So we actually do things. Um, and that means we can actually, we can take in kind of all these insights, all these senses. Now, a great example is say like planet, um, planet labs and with their, uh, kind of constellation of satellites and they can do, uh, optical, well, near infrared, uh, and optical imaging of, of pasture in a paddock and they can tell you where your grass is. And then we take a system like that and we feed that into, um, Helm is what we call our, our software, our like, management platform. So we feed that into Helm and all of a sudden as a farmer, you know, where your grass is on almost like a daily uh, resolution level, um, we can take the best spots on the farm and put the cows there to eat the grass. And you don't have to do 400 cows in a paddock. You can do, you know, 10 cows in this area and 20 cows in this area. And you start to run a system that's like a lot more natural for the cows than um, the current intensive um, kind of farming methods. So um, it will become very interesting how, you um, you know, how much influence the farmer wants to have over kind of just driving these decisions by data because um, ultimately we are empowering a farmer. Um, we're not making decisions for them. Um, we, are, we do suggest a lot of things um, and a lot of those things are backed up by data. But if they say, you know what, I know my land better than everybody else. I know that paddock's wet. Um, even though it's got good grass, I can't put my cows in there. Um, then it's up to like him or her. But uh, that will I think probably will evolve over time with more trust um, in the system and just more experience with, with uh, like more cows kind of under management. I think you guys are collecting a whole lot of data that, you know, maybe right now, or maybe you guys are analysing the data you're getting from the cows, but I think you're also, as well as your product, you're creating this huge database of, of cow behaviour data that people can use way in the future to kind of optimise the best way to, to raise these animals. So that's kind of cool as well. Um, but coming back to making lives easier for the farmers, we have another question in the chat room here um, from Amigiak on YouTube, talking about uh, do the cow uh, halters have solar panels or do you need to go out and change the batteries? Is that another thing that farmers need to do? No, yeah, the, the, so the, the collars are solar powered. Um, it's effectively a, a non-negotiable um, on, if you've got say 400 cows, uh, just putting the collars on is an investment in time. Like, you know, if it only takes kind of five minutes each per, per cow, then you're still, you know, putting like a, a huge section of time into getting a, a farm of money. So um, once these go on, they stay on for four to five years. Um, they're a solid state. So frequently nothing in the collar is a moving part uh, or needs maintenance. Um, the, there's been a huge part of the design for us is getting things like the power consumption so low that it can run uh, through like a foggy uh, New Zealand winter uh, <laughs> and and not go offline. So um, we do a lot of modeling around power consumption and use like a lot of low power um, sensors and low power like microprocessors and things like that. So um, that the, the consumption is is sustainable. So you have worked with over around 300 cows, you said, right? Mm -hmm. How many farms is that? Yes. So that's on, we've done all our testing on uh, one like development block that wow. the reason for that is that's been set up with a lot of extra infrastructure. So like we have cameras all around the farm so we can run. Um, I've even ran that farm from San Francisco. So um, wow. where like on a typical farm, you obviously don't have cameras and you don't need cameras, but for us, this allows us to test like new algorithms and uh, new ad or anything really uh, remotely. Um, okay. And that's, that's really important. So, um, so how many more farms do you foresee yourself expanding this technology to? Well, this is um, something we say quite a lot and that's like, we have very small market risk. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, if we can get this to work at scale, if we can produce you know, the number of devices we need to through a factory, we can ensure the quality and the durability of, of these devices. Um, it's a no brainer for a farmer. So, and what we like to compare it to is like 200 years ago, you milked a cow by hand with a bucket. And then someone came along and said, you know what, like we can do, a bit, there's a better way to do this. And the milking machine was invented. And then now nobody milks cows by hand. Well, effectively nobody in the, in the Western world milks cows by hand. And we're sitting probably in a similar spot where uh, today you either walk behind your cows, and cows walk slower than humans, um, or you're out there on a bike with a dog, you spend kind of hours a day following these animals around. And we're looking at a system that can do that for you. So um, I think fundamentally, 
the farmers that adopt a system like this will have such a strategic advantage that if you don't have it, you will not be able to farm. So um, we're probably sitting there in a spot that is there's no reason every cow, um, every pasture based like dairy farming cow or beef cow or um, around New Zealand, Australia, you know, South America, North America, Europe, like, you know, kind of it's, it's up to us, like how, uh, how fast we can roll out here. And we've always seen that from like, there's been huge interest from, from industry with farmers that are so keen to help out. They offer up, you know, you can, you can test on my cows, like come around whenever you want and I'll help you like develop the algorithms for feeding them and things like that. So it's very like, I'd say it's a very community-based, um, almost a community-based project in a way. Wow. Um, do you have any restrictions in terms of like the kind of landscapes where you can implement this technology? Like if you had really mountainous areas or stuff like that, are they kind of hurdles for you guys to overcome? Well, we, we tend to think that we're probably in one of the like harshest environments right now um, in terms of New Zealand. So uh, like our weather systems are reasonably crazy. Um, we have a lot of rain. We have short daylight hours in the winter. Um, we are reasonably remote like, hey, in, in terms of uh, the rest of the world, we are at the bottom and on the other side. So um, I think that like, if we can get the system to work and it has been working here uh, really well, then it's no reason, you know, everything should get easier as we start to look at um, say expanding through uh, North America. But um, as far as like deep gullies and big ridges and things like that, in theory, it's, it's completely fine. Um, it's just like, how well that works uh, over, okay, let's call it like massive stations and things like that. So there's a little bit more testing to be done there, but hey, that's, that's engineering. That's You can solve those problems. Um, it just takes time. I want to ask you a little bit about um, other types of applications that you think this technology would be able to go into. My own thought is I wonder if this can ever be used for crops, for knowing how much sunlight or water is actually be being intaked in certain areas. But there is a specific question that I really like in the chat from Hanny's Vorwerp that asks, could a system like this be used on pigs to find early evidence of swine flu for disease management? Yeah, so, so the disease management is uh, a super interesting part of this because um, a lot of those times you have signs that are very, very well known and predictable. And, you know, people pick up on these diseases. Typically, the first sign is some visual cue. Like you have a suspicion as a farmer that uh, an animal is behaving weirdly. And if you're a farmer who's picking up on this, um, it's, it's pretty obvious. If you can see it by eye, you can sense that through um, motion tracking or accelerometers. So the idea is that you could be like a lot more confident in detecting these things early and then work out how to manage them. So um, especially in a lot of cases, um, say, so here in New Zealand, uh, there's been like a kind of a topical uh, thing around a disease called M. bovis. And this is transferred through cows touching other cows. So the only way it can go from one farm to another is when you put your cows in a boundary paddock and your neighbor's cows are in a boundary paddock and they touch. Um, aside from literally selling a cow and it leaving your farm and going to another. But um, so this is like, we, I guess we have a unique value proposition here because it's really easy to almost instantly say, you know what, cows aren't allowed within two meters of a boundary fence. That's just straight up rule. Um, and then you've effectively isolated every single farm uh, that either has this disease or therefore can't get the disease. Now, um, how this applies you know, on other animals or anything like that, like I think anything that has a characteristic that you can understand or you can define like you can sense and then categorize uh, an animal into so um that kind of stuff will begin will become quite interesting and like aside from just getting onto um onto say like a pig farm and actually testing that um my answer is like i think so yeah I think that would be really good for, for future yeah, technology. You're going to ask something, Lisa? Yeah, well, I, I just, I'm so impressed by this whole technology and all the different use cases. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, for this to really take off, you know, it, the farmers have to, have to sign up and start generating revenue for you guys. So this next question comes yeah. from uh, Dada in the chat, who asks, is the investment in the system something that uh, even smaller farms can afford, or is there like a trade-off to the purchase in that the farmers are only working like 40 hours per week now versus 100 hours per week? So what's what's the kind of feedback on that? Yeah, so we've uh, kind of, we've known from the start that like the fundamental thing here is it has to be affordable. If it doesn't increase their bottom line, 
Um, ultimately, a lot of farmers that are, are cash poor will say, I can't afford the system. So um, the way that we're going to structure our business model, and we're having these discussions just with farmers one-on-one, but um, is it's a monthly subscription. So you pay per cow per month. Um, and effectively, what that means is the moment you first pay uh, for a, like a monthly cost, um, you're receiving benefit uh, and it's immediate and tangible. So, you know, you put the collars on a cow uh, on your herd one day and the next day you don't wake up at 4.30 and uh, the cows are at the shed when you when you go there. So um, this is like one of the, the strongest things that, that I think attracts uh, interest from the industry is that it's just so tangible, the benefits. You can literally see it work and see it happen and it's not this blind faith. Um, you know, the whole trust me, this is good for your farm. So, and then... The way that increases revenue is there's a whole lot of very, very well-known uh, like farming techniques. These, uh, if you go onto any um, like best practiced farming site, it'll say you know you should feed your cows this much, and you should back fence, which protects the grass when it's already been grazed and it's growing in a reasonably sensitive um, part of its growth cycle. You meant to fence that grass off from cows re-eating it, um, but that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. So. Uh, all farmers know the benefit to it and they say like, yeah, I wish I did, um, we still have time. And then when they see this happen just for them through the system, uh, they instantly get the the benefits and how well that, uh, that will benefit like their situation. So um, that's what that has meant is we've received like very, very strong signals um, from industry. Uh, it's also a really good business model for us. It means when we first put a system on a farm, that's the start of an ongoing relationship that we hold with the farmer. So uh, it's not like we're just going to give them tech and it doesn't really work. And then we say, you know what, you've already paid for it. Um, Good luck kind of thing. That's that's just not the approach we're trying to take at all. So, Right. Those relationships are really important to build because it is continuous. It's a a continuous industry. Well, that's so great. Well, Craig, where can everybody find out more information? So uh, halter.co.nz. So that's our website at the moment. Um, we're based in New Zealand because it's literally uh, one of the best places in the world to uh, to develop technology like this. So, um, like this is, I guess, we in- invented the electric fence, for instance, which is like a, a pioneering innovation for uh, for farming around the world. And like we've got more cows here in New Zealand than we have people. And we had a question earlier that's like, got so many sheep in New Zealand. Well, actually, like we have so many cows. And so this is why we're based here. Um, we all our investment and uh, support actually comes out of the uh, United States. So um, we've got investors in San Francisco and in Chicago, um, things like our legal teams and all that are all over there. So um, it's kind of this like uh, strategic step for us to be based here. So yeah, halted.co.nz um, or in NZ. Uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all the LinkedIn, all the usual social channels we're also on. So um, feel free to reach out really anybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, we wish you the, all the best with uh, spinning up this device and getting it out there and making a real difference to farmers and, and the way we as consumers you know, consume dairy products and maybe even more in the future. Uh, but before we head to break, we do want to give a very big thank you to our patron supporters, specifically our Escape Velocity citizens. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. These people contribute $10 per episode. They make the show happen, and honestly, we couldn't do this without you. Um, We also have our Orbital citizens who contribute $5 per episode. And again, thank you so much. I'm going to give you a bit of time here so you can find your name on the slate, because every week we get more and more and more, and it just blows my mind how everyone supports us. So if you'd like to contribute to the shows of tomorrow too, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And if you're not able to contribute financially, you can always hit subscribe and uh, hit the little bell so you're notified. Uh, Hit the like button. All of these things help us out. Share us on social media. Um, Just thank you everyone for all of your support. We're going to head to a quick break now. And when we come back, we're going to have questions and comments from the community of tomorrow. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. 
and we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Hello and welcome back. So last week we spoke about origami underwater robots. It was really, really cool. We interviewed Brennan Phillips and Z. Ern Teo, um, Teo from Harvard University and University of Rhode Island. So we've got some really cool comments and questions that we're gonna go over right now. So the first one comes off of YouTube from Louise Salsor Jr. And they ask, oh, they actually say, I love the experiment with the new format. The interview was dynamic and engaging. You two did a fantastic job. Keep experimenting. I kind of miss the news though. Maybe a shorter news section inspired by Mike's launch minute launch. Wait, Mike's minute launch? Um, or just read the post from the community about what recent science news they found more interesting. You can create a hashtag for that, like hashtag best TMRO science. <laughs> um, I like that idea. I think that's pretty cool. What do you, what do you think about that doing I like a 60 second? I think if we're gonna do science news again, it needs to be like short and snappy, cause yeah. like, yeah. I feel like our science news would kind of drag on, but like this comment says, we're always experimenting with the show, and like, you yeah. know, I, I don't know about you, but I really enjoy having the interview up front. Like, these people are talking about really cool stuff. I like this. I'm having a lot of fun with this. And yeah. I'm loving like the, the double The interview. dynamic, yeah. It, it's Plus really too, cool. it's a continuation, kind of like from, from space, and space ends here, so I feel like it's a really good like, you know, leeway into, into science. So I like it a lot. I think if we were to do something, you know, like a Mike's launch minute, then we would, yeah, it would have to be some type of science thing that would come now, maybe? 60 second science? 60 second science, like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't but know. I like the hashtag, hashtag best TMRO science. Okay. Um, um, yeah. 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 But if you guys no. have any ideas about, you know, how we could take science news and make it like, snappier and just more en engaging, I think is what I'm looking for, and more energy, but like still conveying the importance of that science. Um, you know, let us know in the comments because uh, just, yeah, what we, what we were doing wasn't reaching that. And so rather than just continuing to do it because we've always done it and because it's what we do in space, we were like, no, you know what? If it's not, if it's not hitting what we want, then, yeah. then we'll put it back in when we can get it right. Exactly. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for that comment, Louise. The next one um, also comes off of YouTube. It is from Zap Fan. Zap Fan. Zap Fan. Zap Fan. Okay. Oh, I said it so corny. Okay. Zap Fan. Zap Fan. Yeah, you have to do the Zap Fan. Zap I think fan my thing. Z's backwards. Okay. Um, so <laughs> uh, they say awesome robots. Could that sort of sample? Wait. Whoa. Could that sort of sampling R be used on a satellite grabbing a chunk out of an asteroid? It can maybe be an alternative to the sampling mechanism on Hayabusa, wait, how do you say that? Hayabusa, I'm so sorry guys. Um, or the planet vac being developed. Great comment. Um, that's, did, I think uh, this one was, um, yeah, this, this was a really, really good comment. I saw this actually off of YouTube. Mm -hmm. and. I'm not too sure about about that, that uh, being used on a satellite. I think it might it's a really good idea because I'm, of asteroid mining and what's exactly. being done. And like yeah. everybody is talking about doing like sample return missions, right? But like how do you even just attaching to an asteroid or a mm -hmm. comet is really hard. Like look at the uh, Philae lander that ESA did to yeah. land on um, comet 67P Karushmenenko. 
Go butcher that <laughs> pronunciation. Sorry, comment 67p. Um, and, and, you know, Philae, they, they had these, like, arms that were supposed to, like, grab onto Philae when it hit the surface and it didn't work. And so it kept bouncing and then it eventually ended up in a permanently shadowed crater and we lost the poor little lander that mm. could. But if we had, you know, this tech, because, I mean, it works underwater, so why wouldn't it work in space, I guess? Um, right just taking that device and and optimizing it for use in space and then just using it to like slowly like grab onto something um i think that'd be really cool and then like even mm -hmm. if you used it um like in orbit you could have the object close around like maybe a piece of space junk and that yeah. space junk is still gonna be like floating in the middle of that like round um arm ball thing. yeah and so like capsule like, you're encapsulating it but not actually touching it as well so yeah. i feel like it would just have some really cool applications mm. and, and i'm i'm like really excited for them to to, yeah. to work on that so yeah we'll write a letter to them pitch an idea partnership with uh esi or something like hey, that hey if anyone out there like really works good. for a space company that would like to partner with these guys you know i don't know i could make an introduction for you guys and I would love to see that working in space. Yeah. That would be really cool. Where's Vax? We need Vax to come yeah, back. Come back. Sure <laughs> reaction spheres, like grabbing arm spheres. It's just meant for him. Yep, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So our next comment comes from the community.tmro.tv from Follux. Oh, I just want to give Folux. some context. It's a wall of text. I'm sorry, but yes. it was a really great discussion um, relating to can we actually live on Mars? That was what the, the thread of the of the comment is from. Ah, so would you can, like humans live on Mars. No, you can read okay. it. Um, yeah, but that's the context. Ooh, okay. So they say, according to Google's wild unsourced speculations, on Earth we are seeing around 100 um, milligrams of dust inhalation per day. Um, I have no idea if that is realistic for a controlled habitat, but we'll roll with it. If the dust is 1% per clit, sorry, bleh, um, that would be a daily inhalation dose of one milligrams, which is 1,000 micrograms per day. That's less than half of the 260, wait, 2,640 uh, micro G per day dose, which begins to affect thyroid stimulating hormone levels. So at a glance, the numbers indicate we're probably going to be just fine as far as th thyroid function. As for Mars, because iodine is a competitor to perchlorate, I'm like, stop, you know, pronounce that word better. Uh, everyone can make fun of me for this. Uh, increased intake of perchlorate can be uh, countered by increased intake of iodine. As long as a decent balance is maintained, thyroid function appears to be able to tolerate a fairly wide range of intakes of the two ions in people without thyroid issues. Thus, you could think of iodine sublimation as the treatment to perchlorate poisoning. Okay. I am so sorry. <laughs> I really definitely should have read that, that out for you. That was torture. You did so well. But here's the big idea what with this comment. What is the thing behind this? Here's the big idea with this comment. Everyone keeps talking about, we can't go to Mars. There's too right. much perchlorate in the dust. The perchlorate, you're going to breathe it in when you get back from a spacewalk and it's going to kill your lungs and it's going to kill your thyroid and, and then you're going to die on Mars, so we shouldn't go until we figure that out. But, like this comment says, and this comment in the community forums, if you're not in the community forums, go and check them out. They're amazing. This discussion was awesome because mm. this person used scientific papers at every step of the way through this argument to mm -hmm. back up what they were saying. And in a nutshell, it's basically, you know, we're worried about perchlorates, but if we breathe them in, um, the problem with perchlorates is that they outcompete iodine in your thyroid. So your thyroid um, mm. makes a bunch of hormones that, you know, help with growth and keeping you healthy. And if, you know, your thyroid's not right. working, then it's a really bad disease and, and, and it really affects you, like with your metabolism and just you have a really bad time. Right. So you don't want to hurt your thyroid and perchlorate can do that, which is why it's bad and which is why they complain about it for Mars. But this, this person is saying that if we just give the astronauts iodine supplements, and we already have iodine supplements today like on Earth, you know, table salt is usually supplemented mm -hmm. with iodine so that mm -hmm. your thyroid stays healthy. If we just do that on Mars, but maybe a little bit more extra iodine, then we could like treat, like perchlorates wouldn't even be an issue because you're just supplementing with iodine so that like the iodine goes to your thyroid instead of the perchlorate. So I think that's really cool. Uh, and this like came from someone in our community that completely changed my mindset on whether yeah. perchlorates are gonna stop us from Is there any Mars. research right now about this being done? Does anybody know? Not specifically no. for Mars spaceflight, um, but I feel like, you know, maybe maybe this is the research direction that we should take because it seems like a really simple solution to something that has 
been tending to hold us back. Like, not, no, it's yeah. not the only thing holding us back from going to Mars, but it's been one of the like points of like, we need to sort this issue out, and maybe we already have. Just take a pill, and that's really yeah. I'm really glad that you actually grabbed that comment as a as torturous as it was to read the, you know, to, to read it out loud. But that's really oh man, that's really interesting. So I'm gonna look into that. I bet there has to be research being done about that. There's, there's thinking research about it. Um, being done yeah. by like you know uh, let's give because perchlorates are also um, an issue on Earth in like drinking water, like groundwater. Ah. If you live in a place where instead of like getting your drinking water from rain, mm -hmm. maybe like drill really far down into the groundwater. Right. And sometimes right. perchlorates can contaminate that, and that's like how we learned that perchlorates were bad for us because you know, people got really sick. Yeah. Um, wow. So that's the kind of research that's, that's going on, mm. but like maybe we could take that research to the next step and yeah. start giving higher doses of perchlorate, and then like t one group doesn't get iodine and one group does get iodine mm -hmm. and see, like, are they okay? Mm. Hmm. Be really, really, cool. really good potential. I love all these comments, by the way, about the moon dust right now. I just wanted to point that out <laughs> um, because it ties back to science. So anyway, next week I'm really excited because we're going to have uh, Sophia Nasser on, um, and she's actually a PhD cosmology student, and she is working on dark matter. She's over at the University of California, Irvine, and she's working on the particle properties specifically of dark matter, uh, which is a substance that makes up 25% of our universe. Um, it's a really big uh, mystery right now as far as the physical properties of dark matter. So I'm very excited to, uh, to be doing this interview. So we're going to have her on next time. And so make sure that you guys tune in. And you actually booked that guest, didn't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. we actually, we met on Twitter. So it was really cool. And um, yeah, she, her research is so good. I know dark matter is such a great subject. I'm sure you guys are gonna be really excited for that one. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. All right, so before we wrap up for today, again, we wanna give a very huge, amazingly large thank you to all our citizens of tomorrow that helped make this show happen. So our Escape Velocity citizens contribute $10 per episode. Thank you very much to all of you. But we also have our orbital citizens who contribute $5 per episode. And a very big thank you to you as well. We couldn't do this without you. Um, but also, there's more. We have our suborbital <laughs> citizens as well who contribute $2.50 per episode. And honestly, this list is so long. I feel like if you wanted to, you could totally be a troll and change your Patreon name to like Ben is always wrong, and then <laughs> <laughs> no one would ever like notice because it'd be in this like sea of names and you'd never be able to work it out. And <laughs> now, hopefully, I've stalled enough that you can find your name. So there's that. Uh, we also have our ground support citizens with an even longer list of names. Thank you for contributing between one dollar and two dollars and forty nine cents per episode. We really, really appreciate it. Again, we couldn't do this show without you, so. Thank you, thank you very much. And again, if you would like to contribute, head over to patreon.com slash TMRO. Remember, you can always subscribe to us and hit the little notification bell so you don't miss when we have new episodes of science. I think it's here. Speaking of new episodes, the next science episode will be on October 6th, which will be next month. Uh, until then, uh, I think we're, we're gonna go. So thank you so much yeah. for watching and see you next month. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.